Okay, thank you, Keith. Keith has been working there for years. Uh, 1981, started full-time at the university. Young engineer, my master's thesis was planner performance of different utility systems. And when Keith asked me to speak, I said, oh yeah, I can talk about planners. I got a nice presentation in it, it's about an hour long. He said, oh no, we need air seeders and drills. So I go, yeah, I got another one about an hour long. Oh no, how it relates to cover crops. Oh, I got another one about an hour long. This is gonna be all three of them squished together real fast. Uh, mostly on the air seeders, drills, cover crop side of things. Planners, uh, not so much. But again, just uh, some of the things I've learned across the years. Uh, again, with the cover crop considerations as well. And I've been working with no-till actually since 78 for my master's thesis, 81, uh, some continuous plots going. Added covers uh, about uh, 2005 continuously. Uh, playing with that before. So I'm gonna share some of the experiences a lot of the slides here I'm going to show you, I took the pictures myself. I'm the one who did the work, did the observations, but a lot of them are from people like yourselves. What have they learned? Uh, and some of it's from uh, the little write-up in the program there says some of my world travels. Uh, show some of the things as well that some other people are doing. But again, with the whole concept in mind, how are you going to get your cover crops up and going? Again, we think about planters. When I first started working with them, everybody thought, well, no-till planter, you take a conventional planter, put a colder in front of it, makes it no-till. Well, when you actually think about it, think about four things. Well, actually, first thing is meter the seed. I'm not even going to talk about that. We take care of that anyway. When it comes to no-till, think about four things. First is cutter handle residue. Second is penetrate soil desired seeding depth. Third is establish seed to soil contact. And this is separate from close the seed beat. Now, some planters did both together. Think of them separate steps. Now, I might ask for steps five, six, seven, eight maybe fertilizer, insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, whatever. But you know what, if you fail on these four, it doesn't matter. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. This old 1260 runner planter, couldn't, that runner couldn't cut the first stick of residue. We put a colder out front, the colder, cut the residue, tilled and loosened the soil, and we call it no-till attachment. I said the word tilled and loosened the soil. We put tillage back in the system. Actually, the early colders were four inches wide. This is only two inches wide. We realized we don't need the tillage. They're getting down narrower. Better yet, industry's given us no-till without the tillage. Second step, penetrate soil desired seed depth. That lightweight runner planter could not penetrate firm soil. Again, till loosened soil the colder. Whoops, we're back to tillage, just not full width. With the loosened soil, I could get seed to soil content. Yes, I could close the seed bee. A lot of people thought this was no-till. My opinion now, when you start looking across no-till equipment, if you've got a colder on there, it means it's not been designed as a no-till seeder. We aren't using colders anymore. We're letting the double disc openers do the work for us. Now, when I first started the educational program in 1981, Buffalo Planner was out there. And everybody says, oh, you're gonna make a Buffalo no-till planner. I go, no, I'm gonna teach you about the concepts of no-till. Again, the Buffalo Planner is the one company that still has a runner, a little slot shoe underneath. Well, I say still, they're not made anymore, but that little runner couldn't cut the first stick of residue. They put a smooth, straight residue cutting colder out front, not a wavy tillage colder. And I say that because when you start evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of a piece of seeding equipment, whether it be a planter, drill, air seeder, think about the think about how do you fix the problem. Can't cut the residue with that, put a colder in front. We cut the residue. Not doing tillage, just doing cutting. Penetrate soil desired seeding depth. That shoe actually had some suction to it, sucked itself down and in. Seed to soil contact, a little press wheel right on top of the seed. Some closing wheels or closing discs behind, a harrow behind to close the seed bee. All the steps are right there. Now a lot of people cuss that buffalo planter. It just wasn't as easy to adjust. There's a lot of problems with it when it came to user friendliness. Hell of a planter. When we start thinking about that, the runners, the slots are gone. Everyone's gone to double disc openers. Those double disc openers are sharper than any colder I found on the market. If you think you need a colder to cut residue, you're not giving the credit to the discs that they deserve. Double disc opener showed two inches of blade contact there. The older John Deere's thinner steel was two to two and a half inches of blade contact. The newer, thicker blades, about an inch and a half blade contact. That's right at the residue layer at the soil surface. It's not at the bottom of the seed bee. It's up front cutting your residue. Make sure those discs are sharp, working together, cut and handle that residue. That's my no-till attachment, double disc openers. Now, to talk about those other steps more in my planner talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, talk more about drills and air seeders with those other steps. Some companies go staggered, one in front of the other. They say that first one acts as colder, second one opens up the seed bee. We see it here on the Deutz Alice planter, the Landell planter now. 
uh, Case IH has it, some drills have it, you know, which is better? We've got other companies saying, well, single disc is all you need. It's basically all marketing, all sales pitch. I got some guys who swear by the side by side, you swear by the singles, swear by the one in front of the other. This depends where you're at, what conditions you're in. I can make them all work basically anywhere. That one disc in front of the other, Case International Early Riser Design. That's the planner we run on our research farm. Got one 1981 and still running it. I love it when it comes to no-till. Now, one reason I love it, though, is a central seed hopper for research plots. I put my seed in the drum itself, plant a plot, dump the seed out, put another one on, and the driver plants the next plot. I can do 100 plots in an afternoon. If I'm cleaning out individual rows, you better have a person for each row, and you're still going to have a challenge to get plots done. But again, that planter was designed and sold as a no-till planter for an international. When Tenneco bought the company, Tenneco sold oil products, chase tractors. They didn't push the word no-till as hard. I'm convinced any planter can be the no-till planter when you pay attention to these steps. The planters can because they're, say, a 15-foot planter like I have, and there's only six rows. Now, let's take a 15-foot drill, seven and a half inch spacing, 24 rows, four times as many. Who out there? I will to pay 4x for a planter or, air, or a drill or an air seeder as there are a planter. That's why we've got compromises. But again, we think about those steps. Now, when it comes to the steps, and I showed mine there in wheat stubble. I got a conventional platform head. Here's a friend of mine, Mark Watson. Mark's neighbor's over here. Uh, planting into stripper head, uh, harvested wheat stubble. Basic old John Deere Max Emerge, no attachments. You'd be amazed how much the planters can go through. You have to pay attention to those steps. Uh, in the 80s, I had a program where I worked with about 50 farmers a year. Let's take you, your equipment, your management, your soil, and you do whatever you're doing, like try no-till. 50 farmers a year for five years. I saw a lot of wide variety of things. I learned a lot from people like yourselves. This is one of the farmers back in about 84, 85. John Deere Max Emerge, 7,000. No attachments. Looks beautiful. One of the fast things I learned, though, was it's much more than the equipment. The engineer, oh, I thought it was equipment. No, it's management of the weed control, the fertility, the soil life, the soil biology, the residue management. Now, yeah, the soil life, soil biology came later in my career. At this time, I already was learning about weed control. Early pre-plant herbicides, rained in and activated. We planted in weed-free environments. Round up that time was only $100 a gallon. I didn't like the burn-down program. I still don't like the burn-down programs. I use early pre-plant herbicides. Again, some of the farmers I worked with, this farmer loved planting down the old row. He said that row is never going to crust, never going to wash out. He says those new roots are following decaying root channels down in the soil. The decaying nutrients are being picked up by the next one. I said, I can't drive that straight. But again, you'd be amazed what your planter can go through. Now, if I had a colder on there, or if I had a residue mover on there, I'd hook that root stump, I'd roll that out of there, I could not do that. We go for minimal soil disturbance. We go let the double disc opener do the work. People say, well, it doesn't abound to over that root ball. No, the depth gauge wheels are on the sides. We cut right through it. Penetrate soil desired seam depth. We put a little extra weight on. Seed to soil contact, it's there. After the rain, you can't even see where the CD was. So again, we look at minimal soil disturbance when it comes to planters. With reference to pasture rangeland, maybe you need some soil disturbance. But again, some people say, well, eliminate the bounce by planting between the rows. That's the worst place to plant, in my opinion. Your last year's rows is the place of the highest biology activity from last year. Why would you put next year's seed further away? Also, why would you drive in or plant in a couple of wheel tracks and the rest of the rows non-wheel tracks? The other thing is that one row is run over quite a bit. You're going to wear out your tires real fast. We always plant down the old row. We never drive on the old residue when we're doing row crops. Oops. Bounce on that button real easy. Now, to be truthful, for our corn on corn, our research, we just plant beside the old row. Again, we leave our residue alone, leave it standing. And again, in my presentation on residue management, I talk about handling the residue. You handle the residue at harvest time. This was a combine equipped with knife snapping rolls, process the residue, no attachments on the planter. The one row in the middle there is a little stunted. He's on the edge of the wheel track. You really want to stun him, put him in the heart of the wheel track, and you wear out your track tires real fast. But again, for corner and corner, go beside the row. For everything else, we go right down the old row. Love wheat in the rotation. When I start looking at drill crops, when I look at narrow row crops, I'm getting roots more often. Cover crops, roots more often. Biology activity more often. 
This is a field already planted to soybeans in the heavy wheat stubble. This was planted in an area of the state where our soybean physiologist says you can't plant soybeans until May 1 because the soils aren't warm enough, and he's working with till soils. I planted these on April 15th, May 1, they're up and growing already. Be amazed when you get no-till soil structure, cold wet soils are not a problem. Cold wet soils are a problem if I've got something here restricting infiltration. Nathan showed us how water soaks in nicely, structured no-till soils. That's what I have with my long-term no-till. So instead of plots 1981, 1981, uh, over plow in the fall, fall chisel, spring disc, spring double disc, no-till with row crop cultivation, no-till without cultivation. We didn't have herbicides back then, so I want to see, do I really need to cultivate? Well, nobody cultivates anymore, they go post-merge. So 2007, I took the no-till with cultivation, and I took the single disc and I converted those to disc with cover crop, no-till with cover crop. So now I've got 10 years of that experience as well in these same plots. But when I look across this, notice the tilled side. The soil surface is beat down. We lost pore space between the soil particles. There's some seeds under a crust. There's some seeds that aren't going to grow. There's some seeds in dry soil. No till side, every bean's up and growing. That's beans into grain sorting residue that year. I love the residue. I love the no till. Tile spade full of soil from each of those plots. The no till is good soil aggregates all the way down. Water soaks in. The till, I should have put it about four inches lower for the till because it is more compact and it was a lower elevation. But you can see how dense that top layer is. Water doesn't soak in as nice. Again, build that soil structure. And from Barn from Ralph Dirch, what a long-term no-till soil looks like. Down there in uh, South America where he does a lot of his work, they're doing two or three crops a year, that living root year round, really building and feeding that soil system. Our research farm, here's a couple of visitors from the United Kingdom. They asked if we're planting. I said, yeah, we're out planting today. They had to take a picture, and I thought it was funny enough to take a picture of them. But again, corn residue stand up pretty tall there. I leave residue standing up right, anchored, and attached. The wind doesn't move it around. More importantly, I get air movement down on the soil surface. So those early spring rains, that soil surface dries out. Worst thing you can do is make a mat of residue. Then you get a spring rain. When can you get back in that field? Leave the residue upright, anchored, attached. And right there, it looks like quite a bit of residue. That's about 210, 220 bushel corn residue through those plots. It's standing up, not touching the soil. Planter comes through, knocks it down, starts touching the soil. We've heard a lot about soil biology this morning. First, I didn't think too much of it in the beginning, being the engineer, never took a soils class. I went to my long-term tillage plots. And the day I went out to do my spring disking in early April, grabbed a hold of corn stalk and pulled. Grabbed a hold of one of the no-till, pulled. Hauled them up, snapped a picture. Which one's which? The big root ball is the till. The tillage has killed the soil biology since there's nothing there decomposing the roots. The one that's really decomposed already, that's the long-term no-till. Soil biology is breaking that down, cycling it into the system, making it available for the next crop. I love the soil biology. Like I say, I didn't know that first 10, 20 years of this project. I understand the importance of it now. Continuous no-till is what makes the system work. That soil biology, like I say, the roots are breaking down, the residue is breaking down. That same field I showed earlier with the standing up stalks, here's a couple weeks later. Look how much bare soil is starting to show up. I have trouble keeping residue simply because the soil biology is so high, digesting it. That's why I'm looking at covers to grow more residue out there. So again, we think about it. This is an interesting picture when I introduced the covers into my no-till. The plot next to it is the fall chisel. This picture was taken in 2014, so this is after uh, 34 years of fall chiseling in the, with spring disking versus no-till with only cover crops for the last about five years. Which one has the soil biology? No-till side does. The residue is decomposing. A lot of people think you got to till to get rid of residue. Well, the tillage kills the soil biology. The residue is still there. It's not breaking down because nothing's digesting it. Now, this is the day I went out to do the spring disking to smooth it out so I could plant. And a few weeks later, that cereal rye there, as you can see, was starting to grow and give me some residue back. Again, that's why I started using covers, is to feed the biology and provide more residue because the residue disappears too fast in the good system. Now, let's switch gears a little bit. Like I say, it's going to talk more about cover crops, narrow rows, wheat, whatever. As we start looking at narrowing up the rows, we've got to start thinking of expense. Four times as many openers on that planter or drill or air seeder versus the planter. 
we start thinking of this. Some of the old early drills were hoe drills. They were fairly conventional in tilled soils because we're trying to push away dry soil and clods, trying to find moisture to plant into. As we went to no-till, this uh, hay buster drill, it's got that shoe opener down there, cut handle residue, smooth, straight residue cutting colder, convert it to no-till. We didn't need tillage. The shank was already doing some tillage there. That's too much tillage. We look at drills nowadays designed for no-till or air seeders. We're going away from the shanks. We're going away from the points. We're going to disc openers. So the second step, cutter handle residue. Here's a John Deere air seeder. It's designed for tilled soils. Take it into no-till soil. The first gang up front was doing a good job of cutting the residue loose to plug the rear gangs. Again, I hate knocking residue loose. I want it anchored, attached. So again, we've got to start thinking about differences. And again, some of the early no-till attachments out there were, let's put colders on there. It's going to make it no-till. No, it's not. It's going to take a weak tillage tool and attempt to go no-till. This is actually a producer in Australia that I visited. The last few years, I've been to Brazil, Turkey, uh, China, Australia, and looking at different forms of no-till. Again, this is one in an area of tillage. He said, oh, I can go no-till. No, this is not a no-till seeder. So again, we've got to think about those steps. Well, some companies say, well, let's beef it up. Let's make it a heavier shank. We can handle the untilled soil. No, that's still a tillage tool. That's a chisel pile, basically, to put seed in the soil. Depth control is depth gauge wheels up, or the carrying wheels up front, press wheels in back. We don't have any independent depth control. Now, again, that's some of the problems when we start using tillage equipment to plant seeds. We want a seeder. When it comes to seeders, there's some all over in the market. This is from Ukraine. This is a Agrosoyas cedar, um, horse agrosoyas, Michael Horsch from Germany, and agrosoyas together, they're making this against a shank opener. Look how black the soil is in the background. It's a chisel plow. What Michael Horsch did is he was selling those in Ukraine for the fields that were too rough. He says, well, we're going to smooth it out first. He sold you one that had sweeps on it, smooth the soil, and the identical frame with points on it with his air meter on it. So it's basically a tillage implement. Again, we're going away from that. And again, the horse agrosoids, that's Ukrainian there for agrosoids, that chisel shank, horse wanted to run higher speed to get some field capacity, the German thinking. At higher speed, started throwing a lot of dirt. He had to put on some heave limiters there to bring the dirt back. Too much tillage. And again, that's a shank problem. Australian I visited, a shank problem. You see how much soil he's throwing up on those shanks themselves. What was interesting in his field, this is, he claims it's great no-till. You gotta be careful. A lot of people say I'm no tilling. They don't understand the concepts. It's sort of like me saying I'm dieting. Uh, well, there's good and bad. He's a no tiller. This is a canola wheat rotation with that shank cedar. There's no soil life there, there's no soil biology there. There's too much tillage. This is his neighbor with a disc opener. Same rotation. Wheat canola rotation. You can see the soil cover, residue cover. Let's get rid of the tillage. In Ukraine, for a field day I did over there, the first one sort of up in the foreground there is a Great Plains drill. Left all the residue there. Next one is Concord Air Seeder with sweeps. Again, the sweeps are a tillage tool. Too much soil disturbance. Next one is that horse agrosoys. It's doing a little better. That shank still has a lot of tillage. What's interesting is they offer it with and without colders. The one on the left there is without colders. The one on the right is with colders. A lot of people say, why spend the money on colders? That shank can handle it all. It's not going to handle it in a no-till manner. Even with the colders, it's not. Well, the colder does at least cuts the residue, cuts the soil, so the shank does less tillage. And we're seeing that out of some Canadian manufacturers. Their shank machine is putting colder in front so they can still run their shanks. They're going with a narrower shank because it doesn't have to wear as well because the colder is taking some more tear and abuse. On stony soils, maybe it's a good thing. On most soils, when you start thinking about soil life, soil biology, it's not a good thing. So again, get rid of the shanks. And again, here's the colder up front there, such as shank runs through there. Press wheel and back, good for seed to soil contact. Doesn't do much for closing the seed bee, but you put enough pressure on, I can get the seed to soil contact, get the seed bee closed. And again, when we start thinking across the years, we've seen a lot of differences. You know, the old John Deere LL drills, big press wheels to get us good seed to soil contact. We're seeing smaller and smaller to be cheaper and cheaper. We're seeing some going back to bigger for better seed to soil contact. Again, think of those steps. On that old shank drill there, cut some residue loose. They put walkers on to get the straw through the machine. People thought about those steps all along. You need to think about those steps. 
Now, the thing is, a lot of people use those hoe drills to cut down through, through dry soil to find moisture. If you're in an area of a lot of blowing soil, you put the young seedling down below, it would be a little protected. You were putting it down below such that what rainfall would come into that furrow. Those are all till soil problems. When it comes to no-till, I don't have as much blowing soil because I have that residue there. I've got moisture because I haven't tilled it. Rainfall is going to soak in where it lands. I don't have to funnel it to my seed. So again, shank drills are on the way out completely. Go to the disc drills. Here's a crust buster drill, a project I worked on in Turkey. Went over there and helped them in October to plant wheat and barley. I'm over there in June. They're taking the wheat and barley off. They're doing double cropping. Again, moisture conservation, vitally important. Look at that background there. If it wasn't for the pivot there, they would not get that summer crop. In that area, the winter crop only because that's when their winter precip is. I asked them, well, does it rain much in the summer? They said, yeah, it's rained twice in the last eight years in the summer. And I said, what do you mean? He said, between May and October, zero rain. I'm like, okay, you guys be no-telling. He grinned, though. He says, well, twice was this year. I'm like, okay. But again, we start thinking about minimizing soil disturbance. They're going in there, minimal irrigation because they're no-tilling in an area that had a lot of tillage. South America, the AVAC opener. We're seeing a lot more flexibility as we're looking at these new drills, air seeders. The individual openers, individual down pressure, individual depth control. But again, that costs us more. Still not quite for exit planner because the seed meter is still a compromise. But again, we've got to start thinking of those concepts. Now, when you think about 4X, what does it cost when you buy the big tractor to pull the big tillage tool, then add a regular seeder? I'll bet you that's already more than 4X. So again, that seeder may look expensive, but as far as the farming system, it's not. This is actually the rear view of the AVEC. You can see how minimal soil disturbance there is there, leaving all the residue in place. Crustbuster. Whoops. I said multiply by four when it comes to four times as many openers. Divide by four when it comes to residue flow. This is not a drill problem, this is a harvest problem. You need to spread the residue at harvest time. The majority of the residue problems I see at seeding time is they didn't spread the residue to harvest the previous crop. A little time spent on the combine, you avoid these kind of problems. So again, we gotta think about it. Multiply by four. Wait for penetration. This is a field day I did in the early 80s this dealer was selling tie drills, and he says, oh, this is a great drill, it really works good. It's got colders up front, it's got a tie opener in back. And he started seeding every soybean seed that's on top of the ground. And he said, oh, no problem, you tighten the down pressure springs, so the down pressure springs back there, it says he puts 300 pounds per row. He said 300 times 24 openers in a 15 foot drill is 7,200 pounds. This is what your drill weighs, it's about 5,000 pounds. 5,000 pounds this way and 7,200 pounds of springs pushing this way. The drive wheel is about that far off the ground. That's how many volunteers it took from the audience to make it work. A dealer trying to sell no-till who didn't understand no-till. So again, think about it. A different demo. This dealer understood it. Look how many weights are stacked on there. Looks like a lot of weights, but when you go wait for opener, that still may not be enough. Four times as many openers compared to that planter. Maybe you need four times as much weight. So again, we've got to do that math problem. Side view of a Marlis. Again, the colder up front, the double disc opener there, that's conventional drill converted to no-till. No, spend the money to beef up the conventional drill to make it a no-till drill. Hey Buster did that. Vermeer sold this drill as well. Put parallel links on like a planter, put a staggered opener on there, bigger discs on there, seed to soil contact without the tillage. There's up in the price, yes but we're getting closer to a planner when it comes to design. Crustbuster, stagger disc opener, parallel links. Uh, here, this is a drill we rented for a couple of years, put in some wheat, we decided to buy our own. Look at those drive wheels up front. They're just barely touching the ground. Those down pressure springs in back on that drill say they can give 500 pounds per row. That happens to be 22 openers on 8 inch space, and that's the 22 by eight. We have 24 openers on ours. 500 pounds per row times 24 openers is 12,000 pounds. This drill is only on the second notch down pressure. It's 250 pounds of down pressure. At 250, I'm almost lifting drive wheels off the ground. When we bought the Crest Buster, we bought a 15-footer. It weighed 7,900 pounds shipping weight. Remember, 24 times 5 is 12,000. We added over 4,000 pounds of weight to our 15-foot drill. Full set of suitcase weights there. We bought a set of markers. Not so much we needed the markers, but they weighed 800 pounds. 
We filled the hitch and the bar under the drill with flat steel. We weighted it down such that it's about 12,000 pounds. So again, think about your down pressure. Do the math problem for your cedar. Do you have enough weight? That old 96 Crest Buster in uh, 2014, we replaced it. That 2014 ship weight was 11,800. Crest Buster had been watching us. They filled the bars from the factory underneath, underneath, added that weight. I still have put the suitcase weights on there to make sure I got enough. So again, add weight. Here's the, the older drill, some extra weights there in the back. But again, that Crest Buster opener, I love that because it is a double disc offset. Cuts the residue nicely, places that seed. I'm seeding wheat there and the soybean residue there. Minimal soil disturbance. I like the residue on top there. Hold the soil moisture there. There's other drills designed similar, the Sunflower, the Landall. Double disc opener, depth control behind. And to be truthful, when it comes to cover crops, I like that design. It's because the depth control is behind. When you start thinking about those drills, there's a lot of built-in weight there in the frame. You're going to need the springs to transfer the weight to where you need it. You may still need to add some cast iron weight or some water weight. Again, here's my crust buster. I like the depth wheel behind because my standing corn residue goes between the openers. Seven and a half inch spacing on 30 inch corn. Now, a lot of people say, well, 10 inch drill will fit on 30 inch corn. It does except for your outside row. You run one opener there with a 15 inch gap or you run two openers there with an overlap. I like an even number. If I got a 30 inch rows, I need seven half. Or I can go to 15. That way my outside rows work out. But again, that corn residue is still standing there. This is where I started learning more about soil biology. That's about 200 bushel corn the day after harvest. I'm out there seeding the cover crop. Got out of the cab to take the picture. That's why I left the door open. This is the same field March 15th the next year. Those are Austrian winter peas growing. People look at that say, oh, that doesn't look too bad. You know, in a nice warm spring, I get that much spring growth. I love them. In a cool, wet spring, I have next to no growth. I go, huh? I don't know for sure what next spring is going to give me when it comes to my overwintering cover crops. The other thing is, is where do residue go? A lot of people say, well, to get rid of residue, I've got to go buy a vertical tillage tool. I need colders. I need something. I say, why? It says, well, it cuts the size of the residue. And I said, so does my drill. Well, it puts the residue in contact with the soil microbes. I said, so does my drill. My drill puts a living seed in the ground to feed the soil biology and grow some nitrogen here and grow some biomass here and harvest some sunlight here. That's where I like the cover crops. And again, here's a project I go going on. Those Austrian winter peas this is a project started in 2005. It's a nitrogen cover crop versus a carbon cover crop being cereal rye. This picture was taken after about 10 years of that. You can see where the cereal rye is just breaking dormancy on a cooler spring. This is about April 1. Not much growth there yet. But look how little residue there is compared to the pass next to it. It's a corn, bean, wheat rotation with no cover versus the corn, bean, wheat rotation with the covers. Which one has more soil biology? Feed that soil. I'm picking up yield in my wheat year as well as the bean year. Corn year, roughly the same. But you know what? There are three years out of the first 12, I had enough yield increase in corn to pay for the covers across the entire 12 years of the project. So just the fact I didn't increase my yield next year doesn't mean don't do it. Across the years, it's paid for itself because I fed the soil biology. That same crust buster drill, we seed all our wheat stubble to cover crop. That's already seeded. Again, with the depth control behind, it leaves the residue standing. I love that. No RTK, no nothing. That drill just sort of follows the row, uh, follow the combine wheel tracks. I love the covers. In my wheat stubble, I like diversity. I like about a 14-way mix. Now, that's planted in July. I got my two cool season grasses, two warm season grasses, two cool season broadleaves, two warm season broadleaves. When the first frost hits, the warm season shuts off, cool season takes over. Two brassicas, deep tap roots, two pollinators bringing in the bees. My other two to make my 14 is usually the leftover soybean seed, the leftover milo seed I had from crop production. But again, it's a wide variety out there. Everything doesn't always grow at the same time. That's good when it comes to water use. It's good when it comes to structure. It's beautiful. Again, feeding the soil biology. We put that across all our wheat. Get that growing out there. Next spring, hey, everything I described in my mix, winter kills. No herbicide application. 
out there planting into that. No volunteer wheat. Mother Nature didn't have to start volunteer wheat because I had a cover growing. We've eliminated spraying volunteer wheat because we've seeded cover the day the combine leaves the field. Now, if you wait two weeks, I guarantee you'll have volunteer wheat. Plant the cover the day the combine leaves the field. Like I said, all winter kills, there's my planter. I say run the early riser. You can see some suitcase weights in back. Make sure I got the weight to penetrate. Does a beautiful job. Also done some research on carbon versus nitrogen. This is a six-way legume mix. All of it frost killers. Three warm season, three cool season. Look like that when it's coming up. Wheat stubble still standing there. But someone says, well, you can buy the co go, go buy nitrogen if you need to at the co-op. Why not plant carbon? All right, here's a three-way mix, German foxtail millet, Milo, and BMR corn. I wanted 15-inch rows. I put refrigerator magnets over every other opener. That's why it looks like this. Cover looked like this. The wheat stubble's still standing, and my cover's in 15-inch rows. Raising a lot more carbon biomass there. Now, to be truthful, I like the mix of loom and carbon. In my research, I see this one gets nitrogen deficient. I have to put on extra nitrogen when I'm planting corn into that. When I put the legume in the cover, I don't need the extra nitrogen. Now, a lot of people say it's going to use a lot of moisture. This is 2012, the drought year. The rain had stopped. The wheat, we had harvested it. I planted the cover, and the cover looked like that in about a month and a half. So what about a drought? I'm growing something, feeding the soil. Think about that. My long-term tillage plots, I said I got rid of the no-till cultivation, I got rid of the single disc, and I added those to cover. Here's what it looks like. Again, the residue is still standing there. Cerro rye growing there. You can see the tillage comparisons there. The plots are smaller. They are established back in 1981 when everybody had small plots. Let's go back to cedars. I like the double disc. I like the depth control behind when it comes to covers. I like it when it comes to standing residue. There's a lot of single discs out there. They're great cedars as well. You just got to start thinking a little bit different depending on how you want to manage it. Now, John Deere actually designed this as a till ground cedar. That's why the wide depth gauge wheel on there. Back when it first came out, they called the 750 an all-till drill. They didn't call it a no-till drill. They had trouble I, saying the word no-till at that time. That big single disc cuts the residue nicely. The seed boot back there places the seed. Depth control is there. Down pressure is there. It's not 4x the planter yet, but it's getting there. The guys who bought those first 750s had some sticker shock because they're used to lightweight drills. But here's why I don't like the depth control beside the opener. This is the planter of the John Deere 750. ran over all the residue. Now, in spring planting in eastern Nebraska, where my main erosion problem is rainfall, I want to flatten my residue and cover the soil surface. In western Nebraska, where my main erosion problem is wind-blown sands, I want my residue standing. So again, which one do you need? For spring planted crops, when the rains are coming, for fall planted crops where I want to catch snowfall, which one do you need? For me, the crust buster works spring and fall. Here's Morris air seeder. Morris air seeder, when it comes to running over residue, there's the depth control, look at the press wheel behind. And you're going like, that leaves a little residue standing. No, it doesn't. Gang two is behind and knocks over the rest of the residue. Again, if you want a standing residue to catch snowfall, this is not a cedar to buy. If you want a flattened residue, it's not bad. A lot of building in weight, hydraulic down pressure. The industry's given us no-till without the tillage. This one does approach 4X a planter when you start adding all this stuff on. So what do you need? The John Deere, to run over less residue, why not take one quarter of the openers from the front, one quarter from the back, and reverse them? This depth gauge wheel runs over the residue, puts the seed on this side. The depth gauge wheel on the back now is in the same place, but the seed's on the other side. You got a gap between them there, you leave residue standing. John Deere has that in their owner's manual, at least they used to, for drilling beans into corn stalks to leave corn stalks standing. And it looks something like this. Again, a little trick if you want to rearrange your openers to leave more residue standing for snowfall or reduced blowing soil, whatever. Paragon opener out of Brazil. Disc in front, depth wheel is on one side, disc in back. Depth wheel runs over the same residue, but between the adjacent openers, it leaves the residue standing. 
So again, rearrange the openers. This one comes from the factory, rearranged already. Go to narrower depth gauge wheels. Narrower depth gauge wheels leaves more residue standing. A narrow depth gauge wheel and no tail is probably more than enough depth control because you've got a firmer soil to start with. Show some different closing devices back there. I'll talk a little bit more about those, but those spoke closing wheels. This is a Thompson T wheel sold by Xapta. Crumbles that soil in. Give you that good seed to soil, or closing the seed bead. Seed to soil contact there is with a fin. It's one that pushes down on the seed, similar to Keaton Seed Firmer, to get good seed to soil contact. But again, closing it with the crumbling action there. Again, some people like that for no-till. When it comes to planting in wet conditions, that's a pretty good one. When it comes to planting in dry conditions, there may not be enough seed to soil contact there. Depends upon you when you're doing what you're doing. Or again, rearrange the openers and put narrow depth gauge wheels on. This is Dwayne Beck's cedar, and looking down through there, you can see how much residue would still be standing. Now, Dwayne says with narrow depth gauge wheels on, you can't just reverse them. You actually have to slide them a little bit because narrow depth gauge wheels, to get them one around on top of the other, you have to move it over a little bit. So rather than a seven and a half inch spacing, he says it's more like five, 10, five, 10. So it averages a seven and a half. But again, it leaves a lot more residue standing. Narrow depth gauge wheels. So it's time to replace your depth gauge wheels on your drill or air seeder. Think about that. Sometimes you want to flatten the residue. Producer in Kansas I met. After wheat harvest, he planted a cover mix that had a lot of sorghum sedan in it and some other things in it. Spring planting of soybeans, he wanted to flatten all the residue there. Absorb raindrop impact, provide a mulch there. It was still standing before seeding, so air could still move to the soil surface. After seeding, he had protection there. So again, what's your function? What are you trying to accomplish? Earlier I mentioned different ways of closing, seed and soil contact. Here's the fin, the side view. It was one developed to put on fertilizer. It works similar to the Keaton Seed Firmer. Sorry, bounce there. Give that seed to soil contact. That Thompson T wheel, do some crumbling there. This producer was comparing. He still had this conventional wheel over there. I see that a lot. People compare which one did they like better. Again, here is the Thompson T wheel. But up front there, that John Deere wheel has been replaced with the narrower wheel. John Deere, remember, was designed for till soil. Their press wheel originally ran on top of the seed that was about an inch and a quarter wide. And till soil worked pretty good. No till, it sometimes rode on the side of the seed bee and didn't press in the seed. So a lot of farmers bought Case IH SDX wheels that were narrower. There's a couple of aftermarket companies make narrower wheels now to push on the seed. Deer was tired of watching people do that, and they came out with a narrower wheel. It went from an inch and a quarter down to about three quarter inch, still a little wide. I like the half inch wide ones better. You get better seed to soil contact. Or this producer, he's got the John Deere wheel. It's on the right-hand opener there. The Case IH SDX wheel on the left one hand opener there. You see how much narrow that Case IH wheel is. He's got narrow depth gauge wheels to leave residue standing. He's got a crumbler versus the standard cast wheel. I said, which do you like better? He said, well, when I need extra seed to soil contact, cast wheel is nice. When it's wet, I like the crumbler. When it's needs seed to soil contact, he likes the narrow wheel. When he's in tilled soil, he likes the lighter wheel. I'm like, how often do you change him? He goes, I don't. So again, what are you in? What do you need? This is the way his cedar looked across the back. It was funny to see all the different things he had across there. He was trying to evaluate. Case IH wheel and some of these other wheels are flexible. John Deere is on a solid rim. That flexible, it's important if you got a lot of curves and contours. The John Deere wheel, if I got a curve or contour, the opener's up here, it's got the seed boot, and on a curve or contour, you could actually force the wheel out of the seed bee. When it flexes like that, it stays in the seed bee, gives you a better seed to soil contact. So the Martin Crumbler wheel in back, it's got a little bit of wear on there. Similar to the Thompson wheel, it's a little wider. The wider is a problem if you're in wet, sticky clays, because it'll pick up soil more. So again, what conditions are you in? The wider in a sandier soil is actually better to give you some seed to soil contact. Which do you need? When it comes to these crumbler wheels for planters and air seeders, in the back of farm magazines, you'll see the little two by two ad advertising it. You'll see all these ads everywhere. Last count I had, there's about 23 different companies selling them out there. Which one do you need? I look at where did that one come from? What conditions were they in? What are they trying to solve? Hard Martins from nice soils back east, plenty of rainfall, not a sticky clay with low organic matter. Sticky doesn't bother him. Keith Thompson invented the T-wheel. He's in a sticky clay, low organic matter when he first started with no-till. He's built it up. But a wide wheel like that pick up a lot of mud. His skinny wheel doesn't. So 
again, where are you at? One of these openers is different. One is worn out. The rest are shot. If you're looking at picking up in a used John Deere air seeder, go to your dealer and buy a seed boot and hold next to the existing seed boots on this used one to see how badly they're worn. The one way on top, this is folded up. That one's worn to the point it's about time to replace. The other ones are so worn, it no longer defines the bottom of the seed bean. You can't get good seed and soil contact because you don't have good seed placement. So again, as you're looking at used ones, get a new boot to hold up there. Again, this is the conventional John Deere wheel. You can see how wide it is. It's not going to work real good. This is on a farm who's got about five of these, does no-till on about 100,000 acres. I'm like, they need help. And again, there's some good no-tillers out there, some bad no-tillers out there. There's some who are doing no-till and actually getting by quite well. I thought this one was worn out pretty bad. This is over in Ukraine I saw. And I visited this guy in North Dakota. He's got rocks and stones. There's a rock there with a scratch mark on it. You see what it does to depth gauge wheels. Again, take care of your cedar. Get that seed placed properly. Like I say, that Ukrainian one was bad. Here's folded up. This is one I saw in Australia. Look close. There's a couple rows there that doesn't have the angle of closing wheel on back. It broke off. Didn't bother it. Would bother me. There's a couple rows that doesn't have the depth gauge wheel. Didn't bother him. It would bother me. And he's got some openers there that are shot that don't lay in the bottom of the seed bead. I was taking his farm because he was a good no-tiller. I about died when I saw this. I saw his cover crop. It looked like this. And you can see which rows didn't have the depth gauge wheel. They're the ones with big furrow in there. He was proud of his cover crop. I go, what do you mean? He goes, that cover crop doubles my wheat yield. I looked at him. Remember, I'm thinking equipment. He was thinking soil biology. I was there the week after they got done with four weeks of 120 degree Fahrenheit air temperature. Soil temperature without residue there was like 160. Four weeks of 160 without a living root. Throw a steak in the grill. Eight minutes, 130, and you can eat it because it kills all the bacteria. 160 for four weeks kills all the soil life. That little bit of cover crop fed his soil life enough that it doubles his wheat yield. Again, living root, it's important. Residue is important. He doesn't have the residue there, but he's happy because he's doubled his yield. So again, think about the system. He had sunflowers in his cover crop. That's all the red he had. That's all the moisture he had. Where there was no cover crop going, there was no moisture. There was no soil biology. A little cover is worth a lot because it has a living root. I use covers for living root. I'm not raising biomass to feed livestock. When you're trying to raise biomass to feed livestock, it's going to take some nutrients because you need high quality feed. It's going to take some water to raise biomass. He was in an 8 to 10 inch rainfall area. He's growing covers and it doubles his wheat yield. So again, none of you can say I don't have enough water. I know you do if you're feeding soil biology. Whoop. Back to the John Deere. When the 750 first came out, everybody says, oh, it's so big and heavy. No, it's not. Those opener springs there would give you 425 pounds available down pressure on that model. Times 24 openers, so it's not heavy enough. You could get the 425 if you added the weights to the back and you added, had a seed box half full. So again, do the math problem. Add the weight if you need it. Add the weight if you're on side hills. Here's an air seeder. You put the agri-pro box on to meet the seed. That John Deere is on a seven, eight, seven degree angle in their openers. On the side hill, he gets side hill drift. This opener is now 14 degrees, tilling the soil. This opener is straight ahead, and worse than that, the seed's no longer being placed behind the opener. Adding weight is how you solve that problem. You add weight to the back of the air seeder to get those wheels to bite the ground so it doesn't drift downhill. John Deere's bracket is on the front. I have no idea why they put the bracket on the front. You need the weight in the back. Add the weight to the back to get it to bite on that hillside. Here's a guy who added weight to all four corners of the mainframe and to the wings. And changed out the cylinder. The two and a half inch in diameter cylinder works great on a 30 foot air seeder. But when you get out to the wider ones, that cylinder doesn't have enough down pressure for those openers. Switch to a four inch cylinder, you'll do better for the down pressure. 
get that opener in the ground. Too often I've seen where the center section works good, the outside wings start coming up. I see it a lot on planters as well. Need weight out on the ends as well. Add the weight to the back. Here's from Australia. This is a Robinson's cedar. You see a lot of weight added to the back of his. He took his, put narrow depth gauge wheels on, squeezed down to six inch rows. He's got a lot more openers, a lot more weight. Do that if you need it. Josh Lloyd over in Kansas, again, all the weights on the back, on the wings, add the weight. Make sure that air seater stays in the ground. Josh's got the narrow depth gauge wheels on there as well. And again, set it up properly. SDX, Mark Watson's Pace H SDX. 30 foot air seater, he's got 36 front end weights across the back of that air seater. Make sure that thing goes in the ground. Mark does some custom work. He says even with 36 weights, that was not enough weight when I'm going into non-structured soil for the guy who wants to no-till and he hasn't been no-tilling to get structure yet. Mark added 200 gallon water tanks, three of them. 200 gallons of water times 8.34 pounds per gallon. You can see how much extra weight he added there when he needs it. Now the water tanks are staggered that when it folds up, they're all three in a line, it's pretty neat. He has to pump the water out before he folds it, which is good because you want it lighter in transport mode when he gets to the field, folds it out, blows the water back in. Again, think about the weight and safety in transport. If you always stay on the same farm, it probably doesn't make a difference. But if I've got fields how many miles apart, transport empty perhaps to be safer on the weight. Some guys are going to 15 inch. This is 15 inch wheat. It gives you a little challenge for wheat control because I don't have canopy as soon. But you know what? 15 inch wheat versus 7.5 inch wheat. That's half the openers. It's half the weight. It's twice the money I have to spend on each opener. By the way, this is planted with the Kinsey planter. There's a conversion disc on the brush meter where I can plant wheat. We got some guys doing that with cover crops as well. 15 inch, again, weight. This is Mark Watson's planter. Those two water tanks on top are water tanks. The fertilizer is carried in the small tanks up front. There's sand in the insecticide hoppers in the front units. There's cast iron waste in the back units. Add the weight if you need it. Or go to that 15 inch spacing, Case H, soybean special. It's got planter units underneath. With half as many openers, I can afford a better opener. It leaves the corn residue standing. We see some people planting wheat this way as well. Again, think about it. Cover crops, I spray a lot of cover crops that big, kill them. Eastern Nebraska rain fed conditions, some years I'm worried about using too much soil moisture. People say you didn't raise any biomass. I go, I had a living root to feed the soil in the off season. My cash crop's getting planted soon after. Now, earlier I showed you some cover crop that big. Again, depends if I got a warm spring or a cool spring. I'm not sure what my spring growth is going to be. But I also try to trust the weatherman. Is it going to be a dry spring or a wet spring? If it's a dry spring, I kill it this size. If it's going to be a wet spring, I let it grow. So again, you got to manage that cover crop. I used to do just cereal rye, I do a cereal rye Austrian winter pea mix. So I get legume and carbon. I get diversity into my system, both cool season there, and the corn bean rotation, both warm season. I got all four types now. In the fall, it looks like this. The peas come up, they're starting to send tendrils. In the spring, they break dormancy, and the rye is breaking dormancy, and the peas froze off, you go, damn. Plant the peas deep. I said that yesterday on a little tour we had. If you plant the peas deep, the growing point, there's a growing point on every node that's below the ground level. The pea looked dead like that. You can see the dead part in the middle. When I dug it up, look at there's four or three shoots coming off of this one. Now, if I would have surface seeded it or broadcast seeded it, there were no nodes below the ground, and it will winter kill. Plant some peas deep. When I do peas as a single species, I plant them four inches deep. That's my hand. You can see how deep that was planted. Now that pea is just breaking dormancy there, just starting to come up. Look at the nodules on there. It's working for me. Didn't produce a lot of biomass, but it was a living root to feed the soil system. Help reduce, reduce erosion. This is Dan Gillespie's farm. His cover, he sprayed it out early. That cover there, five inch rain in May, very little soil movement on that slope because he had roots there anchoring the soil. He had a fed soil, he's got some residue. I've been experimenting with letting the cereal rye grow longer. Here's in a cereal rye in a corn bean wheat rotation, the strips there. In Nebraska, 
I lost crop insurance on that because I planted greens. Nebraska crop insurance, I have to have the cover crop killed before I plant my cash crop. Now, if I'm a continuous no-tiller, they give you seven days. This one was more like three weeks. When I was doing my first shot of Roundup and Roundup Ready Beans was when I killed the rye. Did it hurt me? No, it actually increased yield because it held the beans back, didn't have as much vegetative growth. When I did kill it, the beans used the moisture more for reproduction than vegetation. I like that without crop insurance. Check your crop insurance provider when you start managing these cover crops, especially on termination. Eastern Nebraska, seven days past if you're a continuous no-tiller. Central Nebraska, you cannot plant green. Western Nebraska is going to be killed at least two weeks before. It varies by region. Dave Brandt, his favorite eye gets a little bigger than mine. His is June 15th because of the rainfall he gets. When it comes to raising biomass, he's got a hell of a lot more. But he's doing that to use water. I'm doing it to conserve water. How do you get more growth? Start the cover earlier. I'm waiting after corn and bean harvest. You know, airplanes, a lot of people think about the airplanes. In Nebraska, all the work we've done into soybeans right at leaf yellow. Get the seed to the ground, leaves drop, that's the mulch to get up and growing. If leaves are already dropping, you can't get seed to soil contact. Right when leaves are starting to yellow is the time to seed it. This happens to be under irrigation. So that pivot does the next irrigation of the bean. The cover's going to take off and be nice. Even works into dry land the same way in eastern Nebraska because we usually get rain. Western Nebraska, not so much. Green cover had a field day a few years ago. We're all standing out there. And they're flying on, I think it was just cereal rye and common vetch, I think it was. And we were just all standing there wondering, is that stuff going to hurt when it hits? The rye, you hardly notice. The vetch, you can feel. But again, I think you see the, what, 10 acres in five minutes, something like that. You know, it's nice. But again, in beans, this happens to be just beyond, there's a plot there of sun hemp and some other things showing there. But again, the airplanes work if you get the moisture. And I tell people you need two rains. You need one right away to get it germinate. You need one five days later to get the root into the soil. If you're an irrigator, you can control that. If you're a dry lander, it's shaky there sometimes. But here's a dry lander, sandy soil, flew on cereal rye, simple cover crop, combining the beans, cereal rye is already there. It was under the canopy, so it didn't have a lot of light. There was not enough there to bother the combine at all. Once the canopy came off and the cool season kicked in, it took off growing. He grew a lot of carbon biomass there, kept the sun and wind off the sandy soil, and he's had strips where he says that 20 acre, 20 bushel per acre better corn the next year because the sands didn't get as hot and dry just because he had cover. Again, grow some cover. Keep your cover. Don't get rid of your cover. Rather than hire an airplane, this guy just goes out with a high clearance spreader. Yes, he leaves a track every once in a while. He says the track's probably there from spraying anyway. Follows the track, he's spinning on his cover crop mix again, leaf yellow. He's been into that for a couple years now, loves it. Cheap and easy. We got some guys that actually blend their cover crop seed with their 1152O. You're spreading the phosphorus for next year's corn, perhaps. Seed in the cover at the same time. Oop. Helicopter. We love this one. The airplane has to return to the airport to refill. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're 50 miles from the airport, it's hard to get a pilot. Most of the pilots doing covers, 10 to 15 miles about all they want to go. Now, the helicopter went out the day before with a big trailer with totes on. Each tote did 40 acres worth of seeding rate we were doing. And we spent Monday and Tuesday morning spreading the totes around the countryside. Tuesday noon, the helicopter shows up. Spinner spreader there held 800 pounds, tote held 2,000. So you filled it, filled it again, Filled it again, and then you got in and pick up and drove to the next field. When he got done, he came and joined you there. Never had to go to the airport. He never landed. He set the spinner down, hovered to the side. We dumped in. We did 1,300 acres in one afternoon. Get together with some neighbors. Helicopter will come out for 1,300 acres. For me, my two acre plots, they won't even show up. So again, what are you trying to accomplish? Again, leaf yellow, that field in the background is a little bit late, but it's still before leaf drop. This is one of the spreads they had. Got some uh, turnips and radishes, some cereal rye. They tried some lentils. Lentils weren't deep enough to overwinter. Well, they're surface spread. Definitely don't do Austrian winter peas. Don't spend the money because they're surface spread. They're not going to grow. Peas, 
No, maybe a forage pea, spring pea. But again, what are you putting on? What conditions do you have? If I'm past a certain date, depends upon your area. For me in eastern Nebraska, about September 1, I stop considering so many turnips and radishes, I won't get enough growth. You start thinking about how much growth you got till the killing frost or killing of winter, depending on what you're seeding, is it warm season or cool season. This is an interesting one. This is his cover coming up for snowfall. Didn't look too bad. That next spring, he went to spray out his cover. He spread 40 acres of cover, and he sp sprayed out 65 acres. And you go, huh? This is an airplane. When an airplane hits the end of the field and he's spraying for corn borer, and you have a cornfield right here, and you've got corn borer treated for free, you don't care, do you? He's spraying on cover crop seed, and now all of a sudden, you've got green, you call them weeds, growing. That's why we like the helicopter better or a spray pilot who will fly in rows in your field such that that shutoff happens before he hits the neighbor's field. Now, the bad news is he sprayed 25 extra acres for the neighbor. The other bad news is 25 acres worth of seed that belonged at his ground weren't there, so his stand was thin. So again, be careful when you're hiring someone so they know what they're doing. Research out of Missouri, give them credit there. Again, pilots hate doing two acre plots. They put a spinner spreader on a high boy, two different high boys there, short corn, tall corn. Basically, they found out when you're spreading on corn, you have trouble. Too many seeds hang up in the whorls. The next storm, rain, they germinate there. They dry out. Seed did you no good. We don't recommend it in Nebraska to fly on to corn because of that kind of problem. The other thing is not enough sunlight down to the soil to get up and growing. Now, on their research, they said they kept doing like every week. When the corn is drying down, you get more seeds to the ground, you get more light to the ground, and they said once you're dried to about the ear leaf, it might work. Missouri rainfall. Now dry land in Nebraska, by the time I get to dry to the ear leaf, I may not have enough rain to get the cover growing. So it depends. Beans, they found out the same thing about yellow, leaf yellow, the leaves time to spread it on. This picture's in the green cover fire over here. Uh, seed corn production, we've got a lot in Nebraska. That's a mail row destructor. There's little rolling stock choppers behind those wheels. As they're out destroying the mail rows, they're spreading seed in front. That little bit of tillage and the residue helps that. And female inbreds, there's a lot of light penetration, not much leaf there, they can get seed to the ground. You're doing that because a lot of times seed corn is over fertilized and over watered because you're trying to protect the value of the crop. By doing that, they got a nitrogen scavenger there and a water scavenger there to make room for the off-season free sip. The cover's a no-brainer for them when it comes to protecting the environment. Now, the other thing is, a lot of them graze it to pick up any downed ears. The cover's a no-brainer because they got more feed. Now, to be truthful, our crop insurance rules in Nebraska, when your crop is not yet mature, if you see the cover, you just canceled your insurance on your other crop. Seed corn fields are typically self-insured by the seed company. The farmer doesn't care. So again, check with your insurance provider. Technically, when we're flying covers onto soybeans at leaf yellow, we're probably violating insurance in some areas of the state because it's not mature yet. We just don't tell them. Again, seed corn production. This was flowing on about mail row destruction time. The seed corn is still green. The covers are starting to grow. And I think Rich Russell from Arrow Seeds at harvest time, that's what his cover looked like. Again, turning the livestock out there, that's some nice grazing. A nitrogen scavenger, a water scavenger. Again, it's a no brainer if you're a seed corn producer. Seeding at harvest. Gandhi's got an attachment that goes on the corn head, blow it underneath the corn head, such that when the corn head melts, just the seed for you. Or on soybean harvest, you can blow it underneath the combine, and the spreader mulches it for you. Gandhi's selling that back east, where they got, particularly the southern Illinois and Indiana. We got early harvest, you got enough growing season left, you got enough rainfall to get it up and growing. For me in Nebraska, later harvest and dry, there's no seed to soil contact there. I'd rather wait two more days and drag the drill in the ground, get seed to soil contact. So again, depends upon your situation. The other thing is that Gandhi box, if I'm doing turnips or radishes at a pound or two per acre, that's not bad. If I'm doing cereal right at 60 pounds per acre, that little box there, you're stopping too often to refill the seed. 
what's your seating rate? Which system are you going to choose? Cross seating. Um, some work at Michigan State. They like that. Overseeding or companion crop. They like that. So again, with their rainfall, they can get by with the companion crop or overseeding. With us in Nebraska, we cannot. Check with your insurance provider. The frost seeding, uh, the cool season mustards is usually what they're using to get something up and growing early. That mustard there is growing. It tricks soybean cyst nematode into hatching because they say there's a living root here. They find out the mustard is toxic to them. It's a biology of control for soybean cyst nematode with mustards. So again, different uses. Oops. Gabe Brown, seeding cow peas in the corn. After the V8 stage or growth or so, corn roots are deep enough that a cover up top's not going to hurt you too much. If you've got fair soil moisture holding capacity, Gabe does this. You have a legume out there to fix some nitrogen. He does this for some higher quality grazing after harvest or for silage chopping. So again, that living root and diversity, getting it out there. Now he built this from an old 500 planter. I actually built one from an old cycle 92 using a buffalo toolbar and crustbuster openers. I went the other direction. I'm seeding soybeans in the wheat. It's called relay cropping. We're too far north for true double crop. But like a relay race, you start the one before the other is done. Now, what does that have to do with covers? Not much. What it has to do with having a living root there year-round. When I combine the wheat, the beans are already up and growing. When I combine the beans, that next day I'm seeding the wheat again. I'm growing wheat and beans in an area too far north for true double crop, and I get the living root closer to year-round. Other ways of putting the cover seed on. If it gets caught in the corn whirl, why not put it below the corn whirl? This is a seed corn detasseler. There's little rotary mowers up front. You put the Gandhi unit in back. That mower there cuts the tassels off. When it's a hybrid seed corn production, you cut the tassels off and get the seed down there. The tassel helps mulch it, gets the cover growing earlier. This producer says, mm, after my corn pollinates, do I even need the tassel? He does it on his standard production corn. Detassels it, mulches his cover crop seed. Come harvest time, he's got his cover already growing. My lack of spring growth, he makes it up by having fall growth. Again, what's your growing season? What are you growing? What are you trying to accomplish? If you're planting something like this and all frost kills, or you have frost, next spring you got all your moisture held. So again, there's different management schemes there. Another one built. Drop the seed down underneath. It doesn't get caught in the whirl. Now you still have to worry about light interception, so again, it depends what species you're growing. And again, overwintering. Don't put Austrian winter peas in that. They're not going to overwinter. What are you planning? Matt Van Tillenberg. He was the first one to build 120 foot wide. There's several others out there now. He can cover a lot of ground in a hurry, putting that cover on, getting it below the whirl. Don Berkey. He loves this one. He says he's got uh, 10 foot of clearance there, and the boom is actually 14 foot above the crop. I grew up in northeast Nebraska where we farmed some 30% slopes. I would love to see that sucker on a 30% slope. <laughs> but the other thing is, look at, he's got an air boom that releases it at the boom itself. When it comes to interception of the whirl, when it comes to the interception of the leaves, it's the same as an airplane. Yeah, I think he built this just to say he built it. I've never met him. Have you, Keith? I don't know. Yeah. It's fun to see it going down the road. He actually lowers it down for going down the road. You can see hydraulic cylinders in there. Hagee, you got a Hagee sprayer. For about forty-three dollars to $50,000, you can put a cover crop seeder on there. That's extra. You have to already own the sprayer. But again, air distribution of boom up front. Here in soybeans, it yellows. Same thing with corn. Or maybe you're out there putting on fertilizer for next year's crop. This is Bryce Neighbor up near uh, Albion, Nebraska. He's got an exactric system on there put in anhydrous to put out nitrogen for his corn. He's got... Uh, ammonium thiosol or 1034O to put out other nutrients. He says with seed box there in between, I can put out a cover crop seed. Or if he's seeding wheat, he puts wheat seed in there and puts his fertilizer on all in one pass. He's doing it because he's got that no-till opener on that air seeder already. Again, think flexibility. Think about multiple applications when you start looking at these things. Or in south, southern Iowa, not uncommon to mix cover crop seed with your dry fertilizer, when you spread the fertilizer for next year's crop, you spin the cover on. Now this happens to be just actually fertilizing alfalfa here, but where they're doing it, they're spreading it like the day after harvest, 
hope there's enough rainfall to get it activated in southern Iowa there might be there's enough growing season there might be for me in eastern Nebraska and a little further north and a little less rain I won't do this but again it's an option for some of you perhaps Michigan's done a lot of work with manure mix the cover crop seed with the manure as you're injecting the manure or spread the manure seed your covers the cover now is going to be a growing root to use the nutrients to reduce nutrient runoff from the covers in Pennsylvania, they actually give you a cost share to do that because manure runoff from all their dairies has, happens to be a major problem in their surface waters. But if you've got a plant picking it up, put it in a biological form, it's not going to run off. So again, some options, perhaps. Now, the bad news is it depends how you're putting on the manure. You know, here's one with an airway system. That airway system does a lot of tillage, does a lot of soil disturbance. I see some guys doing covers with... Uh, Triple tills, vertical tillage tools, same thing. You're doing a lot of soil disturbance in the exact soil layer you don't want to disturb, the interface between air and soil. That's where my biological life is. Now, the good news is on this one is the local county board that requires incorporation of manure for odor control accepts an airway. Now, when it comes for tillage for odor control, airway is not near as bad as a chisel plow. But when it comes to soil life, it's still bad. So again, what's your local rules and regulations? Here's a Yetter system. Inject the manure. Less, less soil disturbance. Get the seed in the ground. Seed to soil contact. The covers now are on rows. Still works for a cover to get a living root out there. Livestock, solid manure. Uh, you can't mix that seed enough. You can't get uniformity enough. Well, we've got a lot of guys doing covers with manure again because of the runoff concerns, because of uh, nutrients concerns. Here's a producer who put in wheat just so he had some place to spread his manure. He spread the manure, harrowed it, and then seeded the cover to grow something there and have a living root there and to use some of those nutrients. And this is an area of the state where there's not a lot of wheat grown. We actually have a processor in northeast Nebraska that raises uh, egg, or chickens to have laying eggs. They paid farmers to raise oats just so they have some place to spread manure in the summer. Again, a no-brainer to put cover on that. Horrendous planting acres. Flat land, too wet. Put a living root out there. Grow some residue out there. There wasn't a crop there this year. Similar might be you already have your crop planted and you get hailed out. Grow something there to get a living root there. Grow something there to use up the nutrients that you applied for your cash crop. He carries down a lot of work in Nebraska on hail, hail outs. What do I plant? Word of caution, if you're a livestock grazer, you have to really look at that herbicide label, what you put on for that crop you just planted. As a, for instance, atrazine is cheap and easy for corn. Atrazine restriction label on replant is you can only do corn, milo, or forage sorghum for the first year. If I plant something else there and I expect to graze it, you just violated the herbicide label because there could be herbicide residual in whatever you graze. Now, EPA stand is, that's a major no-no. Now, planting the cover, just let it grow as a cover. EPA stand is, you took your own risk in seeding that. You can't go after the chemical company if your cover doesn't come up. Because EPA doesn't have enough to police the true label. But they will police it as far as food and grazing if they find out. Depends how much your neighbor likes you. Again, prevented planting. Another prevented planting. Missouri River was basically out of its banks in 2011, the summer with all the rains from someplace in South Dakota clear down to Missouri. This is in uh, eastern Nebraska. The water was there for about four months. It was not pretty. Think about soil life, soil biology. It was not pretty. Near Tecama, John Wilson worked with a producer there. First column, no cover. Irrigated corn the next year we planted into that field that had been underwater, 210 bushel corn. When he went out in early March and seeded oats just to wake up the soil biology and feed the mycorrhiza, 241 bushel. For just a little bit of oats, he picked up 30 bushel of corn because he woke up the soil feed the soil biology. Oats pea mix, thinking he can grow some nitrogen, not enough yield increase to pay for the peas. Again, feed the soil biology, wake up that soil, get the living root out there. 
close on some more seating equipment. Earlier I talked about a planter and 4X for a cedar. This one is about 10X for the cedar. This is a serious no-till system. If you're not seeing a Pioneer drill, later is renamed the Yielder drill. They went to wheat fallow rotation areas and went no-till, conserved water, went continuous crop, the double yield. That's why they call it Yielder. Serious no-till. Large double disc opener up front to place the fertilizer. They had anhydrous cold flow, liquid or dry on this drill. Paired wheat rows in back, hydraulic down pressure on each set of openers. That yield or drill, highest price no-till cedar we've ever seen. Here's a rear view. You sell all your tillage equipment, sell all your tractors to pull the tillage equipment because you need to pay for this sucker. 20 foot wide took 500 horsepower to pull because of the weight. That 20 foot wide drill cost $180,000 in 1981. Today's dollars, I have no idea what it is because the company quit making them. But you know what? They targeted 10,000 acre producers. 20 foot wide at 8 to 10 mile an hour with about a six crop rotation. Maybe spring wheat, corn, uh, milo, sunflowers, uh, to winter wheat, whatever. Six crops you can grow in your area and sell. Now, at 20 foot wide, 10 mile an hour, you can cover 2,000 acres times five crops is 10,000 acres. One drill, one tractor, one driver. At $180,000 on a per acre basis, the system's approach is one of the cheapest farming systems I've ever seen. $18 an acre. Well, I had the tractor, $25 an acre or whatever. If you rent a drill, two years, you gotta give it back. Two years, this one was paid for. Diversity, crop rotation. Think about it. Now, as you're sitting there, I did this in one meeting. I had an old timer in back raise his hand. Say, I'm no tilling for $60. $60. What attachment did he buy? What did he buy? Systems approach, no till, $60. Went and visited him. The planter was $60 on a farm sale. Okay. He says that runner planter can't cut the first stick of residue to stay off the old row. It can't penetrate the soil to the desired seeding depth while it's loose soybean mellow ground. It could. He gets seed to soil contact. He thought about those steps. He's no tilling into soybean residue. And it's because his conservation plan in 1985 said he has to no till into bean residue to have erosion under control. With his terraces, with his alfalfa rotation, with his waterways, he didn't need to no till every acre. Now, he thought about the no-till concepts. He's not getting the soil structure benefits because he's not continuous no-till. But he's thought about the steps, thought about a conservation systems approach with diversity, rotation, whatever. I throw that up not so much to promote no-till, but to think systems approach. But I can also guarantee you are somewhere between $60 for that planter or $180,000 for 20 foot wide. You're somewhere between that. You make the decisions what you need. With that.